the natural selection, let's look at how it uh, affects the Hardy-Weinberg frequencies or equilibrium and, and the frequencies. Natural selection, if allele is selected, then obviously the frequency will change. If it's selected for, then it'll increase. Mutations create new alleles and changes the frequencies. You can remember you can have multiple alleles in a population. And the genetic drift, the example of genetic drift is a population bottleneck. So collapse in a part of a population causes changes in frequency of the alleles. Think of some natural disaster that occurs and wipes out large partial large portion of a population. That's an example of genetic drift or a source of genetic drift. Migration, new member coming into the population with new alleles, obviously will change the frequencies. And the non-random mating, choosing desirable traits in mating obviously changes the frequency of that trait because it's selected for, or yeah, selected for. So the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium can never exactly be observed, but evolving population shows different frequencies from expected based on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium says that frequency is in a population remains constant again in the absence of factors that could change, change them. Things stay the same unless they change. So four factors are not like five in the previous section. This is a different. This is this, this is a different section in the textbook. I'm just trying to uh, go over these uh, things, and it relists the textbook. Relists these things, but in fact, we know that they are probably always affecting affecting the population. These these factors, and these are the mechanisms for the evolution of populations. So natural selection continued from previous session. We're gonna go over these things again. So alleles are expressed as a phenotype and the phenotype can be advantageous or disadvantageous to the individual with the phenotype. Advantage can lead to more offsprings, which increases allele frequency in the next generation. And if conditions remain the same, these those offsprings will also produce more offsprings with the same phenotypes, which further increases the frequency of advantageous allele. And over time, that allelic frequency increases. So mutation, again, is a source of new alleles in a population that changes the allelic frequency, because in a population, you can have more than two alleles, multiple alleles, remember? Change in allele frequency from mutation is small unless acted upon by other factors like selection. Mutation can be selected for, against, or remain neutral. And the harmful mutations will obviously be removed at the rate of mutation. Beneficial mutation will propagate through the selection over generations. Mutation is one of the sources of genetic variation. It's the ultimate source of a new allele, especially in a multiple allele population. And again, genetic drift. I don't know why they decided to uh, repeat the same content twice in the same chapter, but since they do, did it, we'll just go over it. Uh, genetic drift occurs by random chance. Alleles in offspring generation are a random sample of parents. So remember, some parents may not survive to reproduce. Some gametes may not be fertilized, etc. So it's a random sample. Imagine a haploid population with five alleles A, five alleles, five alleles big A, five small A. Then by random chance, the next generation may have six big A and four small A or vice versa. 
So the frequency of big A and little a alleles in each subsequent generation may vary just by random chance. And this is an, another example of genetic drift. And the frequency will drift until one is fixed, which may take a long time. And, but you can imagine its effects are greater in a small population. So imagine, suppose there are a population of 10, one dies off without leaving the progenies. That's 10% of gene pool disappearing. What kind of effect will that have on the allelic frequency? For instance, let's say in this scenario, you have green bugs and brown bugs, six of them each. So allele, let's call green small, small b, small g, and brown allele small b. Okay, so currently they're at 50% each. But let's say two of the brown bugs die. They get zap and die. Six out of 10. So now six out of 10 total population are green, meaning allele G is now 60% and 40% are brown. So this bug population evolved, but they didn't adapt. Another example of genetic drift. Um, genetic drift can eliminate an allele entirely by random chance. Suppose by chance in the first generation here, only the brown rabbits reproduced. So heterozygote big A little a or, hetero, or homozygote big A big A. So the brown and white rabbits are produced because heterozygotes are reproducing in the second generation. In the, but in the second generation, only homozygous brown rabbits reproduce. Then by third generation is reached, only homozygous brown rabbits exist. In other words, small a allele coding for the white coat have dis disappeared just by chance or by genetic drift entirely. Another example I said was a, a bottleneck that this genetic drift effect is magnified by disasters that randomly kill a large portion of the population. And we call that uh, a bottleneck effect. And they change, these types of events can change allelic fre frequency in one single step. And Northern elephant seals repopulated from just 20 individuals. So compared to Southern seals, the variation apparently is much less. Northern seals, in other words, evolved differently. And those 20 seals are the founders for this bottleneck effect. Who's, and the, their genetic makeups were not as varied compared to Southern seals. So currently, northern seals match the founder's genetic variations, and that's called the founder's effect, which will follow a bottleneck event. <clears throat> so when individuals migrate in and out of a population, what gene flow can occur. And gene flow is just that. It's a flow of genes. Plants can spread seeds far by wind and animals and end up in population where their alleles are very rare. And that'll be an example of gene flow. Here, a brown bug, instead of getting killed, decided to move to green zone. Then introduce the brown shell color allele to the green population. In other, in other words, brown gene flowed into the green population. So what are some evidence for the evolution? The fossils provide evidence that organisms from past are different from, from the ones living today. So fossils can be thought to show the evolutionary change over time. 
and science scientists can determine the age of fossils and categorize them to determine when the organisms lived relative to each other. Species depicted here are four from very diverse lineage, including Przemolski horse, which is one of few living species, of course. Here's a Przemolski horse from today. And Eohippus, Mesohippus, Hyperia are animals thought to existed before leading to this horse here. So anatomy and embryology can provide some insights. So homologous rich structures. These are anatomical structures that shows suggesting of a, of a common origin. So limbs from different animals all have the similar structures, same bones, but in different shapes. Human arm, forearm looks like that. And their bones correspond to a dog's leg like this, or bird's wing like that, or whale's fin. Is this a conversion or diversion? Evolution. Convergence is something that's serving the same function. Divergent is stemming from same origin. So this is an example of divergent evolution, creating homologous structures. Vestigial structures. These structures exist, but appears to have zero function. They may have been residual part of ancestor, like for instance, wings on a flightless bird, leaves on a cacti, pelvic bone on whales, and appendix on in humans. Then there are the analogous structures. These are the structures that have the same function, suggesting same selection pressure. So Y coats on this winter, uh, or arctic fox versus this bird. Is this a conversion or divergent? This is a convergent evolution. They're converging to the same function. And embryology, the study of development, also can be used to understand evolution, shows structures that are absent in adults, but show in embryos. In other words, gill slits in all vertebrates, embryos, including humans, and the branchial cleft cyst in humans arise from failure to close or obliterate one of the one of these gill slits of branchial clefts. And also the great apes have tails during development, but is lost after birth by birth. And this may be due to the pef, due to the mutational changes that affect the embryogenesis causing the amplified differences in adults, but not in embryos. In other words, whatever it affects the adult, it doesn't affect the embryo. So whatever affects the adult was selected, but what uh, that doesn't affect the embryo uh, also got selected along with it. And biogeography can also provide some insights into how evolution works. This is the study of bio, uh, geographical distribution of organisms on the planet. Uh, Pangaea is the landmass thought to have broken up into Laurasia and Gondwana. And Protici, Protea, Proteaci, uh, is present only in Australia, Southern Africa, and South America, maybe due to the pl uh, plant's presence in Gondwana before it broke up into Australia, Southern Africa, and South America. Also, marsupials on Australia, finches on Galapagos, and the species in Hawaiian Islands not found anywhere else, also reflect 
their relationship to the ancestral species. So how do we use molecular biology in evolution? So obviously DNA is the universal genetic material, except for viruses, which can use RNA. And genetic code is very similar in all life. And there are three divisions, domain, uh, domains. There's the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And reflect the re contain differences in ribosome and membrane structures. And the relatedness can be seen in similarity of DNA sequences as is as expected with descent with modification. And gene duplication may provide a way to tweak a function of a given gene, given protein. There's some problem with that because there's an issue with gene dosage. And what, uh, in, if it's duplicated and if one copy remains functional while the other gene gets modified by mutation, selection, and drift, that could provide mechanism by which it can evolve. But again, there's some problem with that because gene dosage issue. So how does speciations occur? Well, so a species is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding individuals that can produce fertile offsprings. Hybrids are the obviously extension to this rule. So the mechanism for speciation uh, deals with the formation of two species from one original species. Darwin, Dar Darwin argued that if this was a branching event. And here's a Darwin's diagram show, showing the brand, speciation and the branchings shown here, which is quite similar to modern drawing of phylogenetic tree of elephants. So it's when two new populations must be formed from one original population, and they become impossible for individuals from the two new population to interbreed, then you can cause speciation. And there are two categories of those types of uh, speciations. One is the allopatric speciation, meaning other homelands, this involves geographical separation of population from the parent species. And then those uh, separated populations subsequently evolves separately. Then there's the sympatric speciation, same homeland. This involves speciations occurring within a par parent species while remaining at the same location or one location. <clears throat> So how does uh, speciation through geographic separation occur? <clears throat> so geographically continuous population has a gene pool that is relatively homogeneous. And gene flow, where movement of alleles within the species is relatively free. And allelic frequency remains similar across the region. Geo geographically discontinuous population. Gene flow becomes disrupted because they're discontinuous. They can't flow freely between each other. And then allelic frequency for that gene become different. So the new allele can arise from mutation in each population, which will experience different natural selection. They're at different locations. And that obviously will enhance the genetic drift because population is smaller. Then two populations will diverge from each other and until interbreeding becomes impossible. Then you have created a brand new species. So reproductive isolation, that refers to the inability to interbreed there are two types, prezygotic and postzygotic. Prezygotic refers to before fertilization, 
Post-zygotic mechanism refers to after fertilization. So pre-zygotic deals with traits that allow mates to find each other. Timing, pheromones, locations for mating, mating rituals, etc. These are the barriers to mating. Post-zygotic me uh, mechanism deals with ge actual genetic incompatibility. And that prevents proper development of viable embryo or production of fertile progeny. This is another barrier to interbreeding. So for instance, female horse crossed with female donkey that produces a, a infertile mule. Liger, Tigon also, the, in, in those, the females are fertile, but males are not. So obviously, liger cannot mate. Female liger cannot mate with female uh, male liger to produce a progeny liger. And the allopatric speciation, due to isolation, can occur in many different ways: new river, erosion forming the valley, or traveling to a new location without a way to return. That's example like sea falls in the ocean carried by ocean currents and lands on a different island. That's an example. Allo, other homeland. There are two types of allo's uh, Patrick processes. Uh, one is dispersal. Few members move to new geographical area. Vicarians, natural situation that physically divide the population. And the genetic Different, different genotypes and phenotypes seen in northern spotted owl versus Mexican spotted owl is an example uh, thought to be caused by uh, allopatric processes. Initial divide may have been caused by the glaciers. So these two populations were separated by glaciers. And further the distance that separate the original population speciation becomes more likely. There's, there's adaptation, no, no gene flow, etc. And then there is speciation that occurs through adaptive, radi adaptive radiation. This is the one species disper dispersing, radiating out into multiple locations and you lead to multiple speciation events. And founder species seen here this this is a honey creeper species may have evolved from that radiative adaptive radiation mechanism and Hawaiian islands surrounded by water provide isolation for many organisms and the honey uh, creeper found in Hawaii may have evolved from one founder species and they all show different beak shape and sizes depending on their diet. So thick beak, beak eats fruit seeds, long beak for eating nectar, nectar, nectar. And Darwin's finches also showed adaptive radiation. What about sympatric speciation? Uh, speciation without geographical separation, same homeland. This can begin with polyploidy, which arise from meiosis, remember? Non-disjunction causes polyploidy. There is this, uh, there is the autopolyploidy, where individual has two or more complete sets of chromosomes from its own species, again, from non-disjunction. Plants can get this error and still self-fertilize or fertilize other autopolyploid plants with the same diploid number. So 2N plant makes 2N polyploid gamete. If it self-fertilizes, then this 2N uh, gamete fertilizing a 2N gamete which leads to 4N plant. This tetraploid 
cannot reproduce with the ancestor, but they can reproduce with each other. Let's look at how that might occur. So here's an allopolyploidy, gametes from two different species combined. Species one has normal gametes, but species two has polyploid gametes. Here's species one, here's species two. So species one produces these three chromosomes, produces gamete of the DNA content one end, the one copy of each. But this species produced gamete that are, that is two n. It has two copies of the the two chromosomes pairs, but it only contains two chromosomes. So if that's the case, then if after first mating, the chromosomes will line up because here's a chromosome pair from polyploid, which is two n, but it. After mating, you still have this one N uh, genome from the normal gamete. So if this produces a polyploid gamete, it has to, it can combine with another one of normal gamete in a second mating, second generation mating, that produces viable, properly paired a one, two, three, four, five chromosome plant that are 2N. So new species of polyploid gamete combining with one normal gamete leads to viable uh, generation. Wheat, cotton, tobacco, these are all allopolyploid plants. And about half of the old uh, plant species studied relate back to species evolved through polyploidy. This is really rare in animals and often lethal, but does occur. And it's also a note that these crops are larger and uh, more robust than if they're not polyploids. That probably is why they were selected as our food crops. <clears throat> so species without geographic separation, how does that occur? Sympatric speciation, uh, staying in the same location. This can occur if organisms evolve to use different food source. Here's a chiclet that is thin-lipped, and here's another chiclet that is thick-lipped. The subpopulation with new food source may remain separate from original population and accumulate genetic differences. So chiclet in Nicaragua is example of such. They are, uh, as far as I recall, if I recall, recall correctly, they're in different place in a water column, different depths. So the, they don't really associate with each other only with each other. Uh, and apple maggotflies that are used to infest hawthorn's tree recently jumped hopes and now it infests apple trees. And these flies also show differences in uh, appearance and traits compared to the original population. And we'll leave it there and we'll continue with phylogeny next.